Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Gray Refuel, where I recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today's the 1st of July, 2021. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So the London network upgrade, the one that includes EIP-1559, went live on the Girly testnet uh, earlier today for me, a few hours ago. Uh, you can kind of like watch ETH being burned, watch the transactions going through on the Watch the Burn website here. Of course, this will be linked in the YouTube description, but this is the second testnet uh, after Robston to go live here, which is really cool to see. Everything went smoothly. Um, there was no issues from what I can tell. There's ETH being burned, as you can see up here, about 79 ETH has been burned so far. Um, uh, this is obviously a test net, so it's seeing a lot less usage than the main net. Uh, and you can kind of like split it on this chart into like the amount of ETH that was burned, the base fee, which I think might be bugging out actually right now, and the kind of transactions happening on the uh, the chain here uh, on, on the test net. So it's really, really cool to see this. So where we go from here, next is Rinkaby in another week from today, uh, or I guess like from a little while ago, uh, sorry, from about 12 hours ago. Uh, and then once that's deployed, I don't know if... So I th the all core devs meetings are done on Fridays normally, which means that I think that if they were to announce a mainnet block date, it would have to be essentially maybe next Friday, uh, if, if kind of like the Rinkeby testnet is going live. But, you know, who knows if they're going to do it then. Maybe they want to wait and, and see. But we might get a mainnet block date next next Friday. I think that's when the next all core devs call is, which means that if everything goes well, um, you know, everything's gone well for the two testnets so far, don't expect to see any problems on Rinkeby. Uh, we should expect to see 1559 in late July, early August. I'm probably going to put uh, my bets on early August just at this point. Maybe the, the core devs want to play it safe. Uh, um, and make sure that the test nets have like, you know, you know, the first test then has like a, at least a month to run through it all to see if it's all good. You know, ha we have enough time to kind of spam the network the transactions and kind of really stress test it. So I would expect early August, which is fine. I mean, obviously the, the original date that was given was a tentative date of July 14th, but it's definitely not happening on July 14th, but early August is two to three weeks. As I've said before, that's nothing. I mean, you know, that that's that's fine. And it, gas is cheap now these days anyway. So I, I guess like it's not, you know, a huge rush, uh, huge rush or anything like that. But still, it's cool to see uh, the two test nets going off without a hitch. Just speaks to the fact that the developers uh, and the core developers and the research and everything know exactly what they're doing when it comes to this sort of stuff. And it inspires a lot of confidence, that's for sure. So looking forward to the Rinkby deployment next week. So speaking of gas prices, uh, Taken's Theorem here on Twitter put out a, an interesting uh, kind of like animated uh, image here, a GIF, uh, basically going through what gas prices kind of look like in you know each days of the week, essentially. So like off-peak and on-peak. So you can see here that, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of like pause this once all the days are done here so that you, you guys can see this properly. So... Oops. Yep, there we go. I got it. Got it perfectly, actually. So you can see Wednesday is the most expensive, and you can see hour of the day in uh, in NYC time, so East Coast US uh, time here. I think just eyeballing it, what three PM on the the US um, East Coast is the uh, most, I guess, like expensive time to transact on Ethereum, and the least expensive would be around the same time on a Sunday uh, to to transact on, on Ethereum here, which makes sense, right? You know, on the weekends and and things like that, people are doing less transactions, of course. Uh, I don't know, like. Like why people would be doing more transactions like midweek, so to speak. I don't know if there's any kind of like explanation for that. Uh, I guess maybe for some reason people just like get really, I mean, you know, Wednesday is kind of referred to as like hump day, right? It's like midweek, you know, everyone's probably like, you know, they, they, they started through Monday and Tuesday, their work week, and then they're at Wednesday and they're like probably, you know, really into the groove of things. And then by Friday, they kind of like taper off. Um, but you can see here on Thursday and Friday, I guess like it, it comes off. So, you know, starts kind of like, I guess in the middle on Monday, uh, peak goes up on Tuesday and then Wednesday it's where it peaks. And then from there, it drops off dramatically on Thursday, Friday, obviously Saturday and Sunday drop off from there as well. So, so yeah, I think I, thought, I just thought this was a really cool visualization. And this Twitter account, Taken's Theorem, does a bunch of these. So if you're interested in seeing just like different cool visualizations of things that go on in Ethereum, definitely give this account a follow. Um, but, you know, it, it's funny seeing like the gas prices here. Like the, the the most expensive that it got to during June was almost 40 kind of guay. This is average, by the way. This is not, um, this is obviously not uh, the highest or lowest, whatever. This is just the average gas prices. And the average was, was not even 40 guay. Whereas if you just took this from a month before in May, you uh, you would have seen that the average was like a hundred plus, which is which is pretty fun. It's like almost double, um, and that wasn't even like on the peak day. This is peak average. Um, the average. This would have been the average on um, you know uh, I guess like uh, the hundred grade, like on a normal day because the the network was so 
kind of congested so yeah fun to, funny to see things kind of play out here and you can actually see like d during each time of the day as well i mean obviously the peak is going to be afternoon uh, or like afternoon evening kind of thing but then you can see like early morning late evening uh, uh east coast us time here it's just like falls off a cliff essentially so if you want you know the, the best time to do your transactions seems to be on a monday at midnight uh, US uh, time, uh, NY, uh, sorry, New York, New York City time here. So, and you know, and, and then the worst time to do a transaction would be, as I said, like up here at uh, Wednesday at about, about like 3 p.m. or something on a Wednesday. So, yeah, cool visualization from Taken's Theorem. If he's watching this or she, oh, he's watching the refuel, keep these up. I really, really enjoy them. So, this account, the Ethereum Fear and Greed Index account on Twitter, posted out this uh, basically just this picture of a quote from Vitalik that says, uh, so this, this is Vitalik saying this, uh, he goes, quote, whereas most technologies tend to automate workers on the periphery doing manual tasks, blockchains automate away the center. Instead of putting the taxi driver out of a job, blockchain puts Uber out of a job and lets the taxi drivers work d uh, with the customer directly, uh, end quote. Now, Obviously, I, I think this isn't like an older quote uh, because this is talking about like decentralized, I guess, like Uber and decentralized kind of like Web2 services, whereas these days it's all about decentralized finance and, uh, you know, a bunch of other things like DAOs and NFTs. But I think the same principle applies, right? What blockchains do um, and specifically what Ethereum does is it basically automates away the center. So if you want to think about the center in the context of DeFi, you're automating away banks, for instance, like um, and then just like these, these large kind of like financial institutions that are getting replaced by protocols and code that live on Ethereum and it, it lets users go directly to the source essentially. Like, you know, when you're interacting with one of the DeFi protocols, you're going directly to the source on on, on Ethereum. Uh, you're interacting directly with the contracts. There's no middlemen or anything like that. Uh, and, you know, you, you get like that that kind of like smooth experience. Now, of course, if you wanted to, you could go through a third party. And I, I wrote about this in the, the newsletter the other day where there's, I mean, I spoke about Compound's treasury product where Compound is, is essentially going to act as like a, I guess, like a financial institution um, for, not, not the protocol, the, the actual company, Compound Labs, for, uh, I guess, like compound. So, so there'll be the compound kind of, I guess, protocol. The center would be compound labs. And then you have like their institutional and business customers coming in, uh, going through compound uh, treasury, the product compound treasury, and that touches compound protocol. So that's like a middleman there, but that's fine for businesses and institutions and whoever wants to use that. That's just a choice. Uh, whereas, you know, a lot of the time in the traditional finance system, you don't have a choice. You have to do it one way or another. Like there's no going straight to the source. You have to use one of these centralized intermediaries. Whereas with Ethereum, you have the choice. Uh, obviously, you can go directly to the source yourself or you can use a third party or you can use something like a, a, a protocol on chain like Yearn that lets you just pull funds together. Um, and it, it kind of is a third party, but, you know, it's 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 not like a, a centralized kind of like financial institution like that we, that we kind of... Um, I guess, know of from the traditional system. So I, I think this is a really profound way to describe blockchains and what they enable to people. Because I think, you know, people still obviously don't get it. They don't they don't understand what the value prop is. You know, you say, oh, it's decentralized, it's censorship resistant, blah, 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 all the buzzwords. And a lot of people, this means nothing to them, really. At the end of the day, if they don't have any kind of like prior knowledge here into these things, it doesn't really mean anything to them. So if you describe it like this, where you basically say, well, you know how there's this company, you know, like your bank, right? Just say a bank name. You know how there's like JP Morgan, for example, and you have to go to JP Morgan if you want to do things like buy into, you know, stocks to a brokerage account or whatever, or, you know, Know, do kind of like um, digital payments and stuff like that. Or, you know, you don't have to go to JP Morgan for that, but they they kind of like allow you to do that, like wires and things like that as well. Um, so, and you tell people kind of, okay, well, what Ethereum does is it basically removes JP Morgan but uh, uh, from the equation and replaces all the services that they give you with code on, on kind of like this blockchain thing. And that means that you don't have to deal with any centralized parties. You can just go directly to the source. So that's that's kind of like um, an easy way to explain it to people. And I think that, that a lot of people would actually get that and it'll click with them but maybe even the uber example is even better than than kind of like uh, i guess like the the jp morgan example and another way to explain it is it's just peer-to-peer -peer. and the easiest way to explain peer-to-peer -peer and what that means to people is kind of relating it back to torrenting because you know for better or worse everyone has kind of like torrented something whether that's been for piracy reasons or something else so they understand kind of like what this peer-to-peer 
peer-to-peer file sharing is. And then you explain to them, you go, okay, well, you know how you can like file share online and you can kind of like, um, you know, download movies or whatever, right? Um, you no, know, just just in, in simple terms for them to understand that the, in the same vein, you can do a peer-to-peer kind of like transactions on Ethereum, whether they be monetary or otherwise, where uh, it's kind of like decentralized because of, there's no central party processing it or anything like that. Um, and, you know, I think that's another good way to explain it to people. But still, very profound kind of like quote from Vitalik here. I'm not sure exactly when he said this. It must have been a while ago. But still, I mean, Vitalik, we're, we're so lucky to have Vitalik. Like, I'm not going to fawn over him on, on the refuel, but I think Ethereum is so lucky to have such, uh, you know, I mean, he's younger than me. Like, I'm 29. He's, what, 26 now? Something like 25. And it just feels like he's been around for so long and achieved so much already. And I think that just speaks to his character and, you know, how, I guess, like, um, prescient he is and, and how far into the future he can see. And also, I mean, you know, he has so many other kind of qualities that it just amazes me at the end of the day. And he, he can kind of put into words things that uh, a lot of people can't. So yeah, I, I guess like thanks to the Ethereum Fear and Greed Index Twitter account for posting this quote. I hadn't actually seen it before myself, but still very, very true. And it rings uh, very, I, I think it's just like a really great kind of a way of explaining things to uh, uh, blockchains to people. So there was this kind of scam that uh, came out called Antimatter, and they'd been around for a little while here, but they posted a tweet uh, basically a few hours ago, I think, saying, Dear community, after in- in- after internal discussion, uh, Matter has decided to move forward uh, the unlock all strategic investors. Sorry, the English is a bit broken here. Uh, we believe this will benefit the protocol in the mid to long term, helping filter long term supporters of the project. Thank you for your understanding and support. So, I mean, I quote tweeted this and said, this is what we call advanced rugging, right? Advanced rug pull. Because they basically just said, we're going to unlock all of our kind of like early investors that got in cheaper than all of you, and we're going to let them dump on you. And obviously, this is like a, a total scam here. Now, what I wanted to talk about was not matter in particular, because I have no idea what this project is or what it did. It says this here, it's like a perpetual derivatives protocol. Well, I mean, it's nothing now. But um, what I wanted to talk about was just scams in general in this space. And scams come in so many different flavors in this ecosystem. And I think it's actually so, so hard for people to avoid getting scammed because what can look like a legit project can end up being a scam or what can end up happening is that the legit project's token could pump really, really kind of high. And then you have, you know, the insiders, the investors and the team or whatever being like, well, why am I going to build this product now if I've already made so much money? I'm just going to dump it and then kind of like, uh, you know, uh, I guess pretend to be working on this project and then never deliver anything. So from, from that lens, it's just, there's so many different ways to kind of get scammed in this ecosystem. And this is what makes it even harder to invest too. I mean, I've spoken about on the refill plenty of times how I've said that it's so hard to invest in this ecosystem. Like as soon as you start going down the risk curve and, and exit like the BTC and ETHs of the world, it just becomes so incredibly hard to pick something that outperforms ETH. It becomes incredibly hard to pick something that's not a scam. It becomes incredibly hard to pick something that's actually going to succeed. Like there's so many things to consider. And, and, and it's just like, I mean, and, and that's all early stage investing. You know, when something eventually kind of IPOs and is on the stock market, I mean, it's already kind of like opens at like billions or tens of billions of dollars of market cap. But at that point, it is a business that has been around for quite a while. I'm not talking penny stocks here. I'm talking like things that are listed on the, the New York Stock Exchange. But, you know, these things are a real business. Uh, you know, maybe they're not making a profit because they're still VC money funded, but they're still, you know, generating revenue. Uh, you know, they're legally registered, all these sort of things. But the problem with kind of like Ethereum, not, not Ethereum, but like crypto in general becomes is that you can basically launch a token from day one before you even have like a working product or anything and you can build up hype for your, for your project with promises and you can achieve like a billion, multi-billion dollar market cap just by doing that. And there's numerous projects out there that have done this. And g- due to crypto's kind of like nature to just pump everything like during bull markets, what ends up happening is that you have these projects that should not be worth anywhere near billions of dollars. Um, and then you have like uh, the the project insiders, whether they be team or early investors, just dumping their tokens because they think to themselves, wow, this project hasn't even got any traction. I'm already up like, you know, sometimes 100x on this thing. Why am I holding it? And that's why you see a lot of the charts. They look very similar. And it's not just them. It's, it's, it's the, the opportunistic traders as well. The charts look very similar. They'll have like a spike and then they'll just have like a long drawn out period where they just keep going down against USD, ETH, and BTC. Um, And, you know, they they might not even be in like a scam, but generally like it's just the way the industry works by issuing a token or a publicly traded kind of like thing 
so early. Now, you know, in Antimatter's case, it turns out it actually was a scam because you don't unlock all strategic investors' uh, stake in the protocol uh, and, and kind of justify it by saying that this will benefit the protocol in the mid to long term uh, by helping to filter out the, long, the short versus long term supporters, which basically this is them saying, well, we're going to unlock the strategic investors and see which ones dump and see which ones stick around. I mean, that's total bullshit. Like, that's just the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. And that's why I said that's, that's in advanced rugging. Um, so yeah, be, just generally be careful out there, everyone. It's so easy to get scammed, so easy to get rugged. And, you know, rugging comes in many kind of different kind of shapes and sizes. And I think the word has kind of lost most of its meaning at this point. But also just like putting your money into, into new smart contracts. Very easy for exploits to be in those contracts or for the developers to kind of like just steal the money out the, of them if they want to. Because a lot of this space is anonymous uh, and that comes with, you know, good and bad kind of trade-offs there so just generally uh you know just just try like to to not kind of like fall into these things and, and you know there's many different tips that i can give you and i think i've, I've talked about how there was a thread from uh coin gecko's founder or co-founder the other day how, how to keep your crypto safe but that was more i guess like centered around how to keep yourself secure and there were some tips in there about scams and things like that but generally, my rule of thumb when looking at these sorts of things and looking at new, newer projects and stuff like that is I look at the valuation of the project if they have a token. And if it's already like outlandishly high for what the, the, the project has in terms of traction, I don't even go near it. I don't even look into anything else. I just look at the, the fully diluted value and um, you know I look at kind of like, especially if it's a newer project and I look at their traction and if their traction is very minimal, then I don't touch it. And you know people like during the bull market tried to meme this thing that, the fully diluted market cap didn't matter and unlocks of, of investor tokens were bullish and all these sort of things. And I think that that actually uh, ended up hurting a lot of people because that's so not true. Like as someone who uh, spends a lot of time, I guess, like on the, the angel investor side of things and sees a lot of these deals go through, uh, you know, th th that's absolutely not true. Like there's no such thing as a, a, a bullish unlock. There are exceptions to the rule, of course. Like I, I remember thinking that um, Solana would dump really high when they had their unlock in December, but uh, it didn't, right? It didn't. Uh, obviously went on to to perform quite well um but you know that's just an exception the the rule is really that a lot of these projects that had really high fully diluted market caps, as soon as the investors started unlocking investing over time, they dumped. And this is for, for multiple reasons. You might have investors on your cap table that don't care about like anything but, but making money. You might have investors that are, are, are actually obligated by law to um, de-risk once they make enough on their investment. And this is actually true for a lot of funds and VC and uh, funds, uh, uh, sorry, fund managers and VCs out there, is that they're, they're, the fiduciary duty is to uh, make the most money for uh, for their clients as they can. And if they see that a protocol is already up 100x that they've invested in, well, I mean, that's an incredible return in a short amount of time. So they actually have to sell some. So there's so many of these things kind of going on. There's so many narratives. So just like my number one tip is just to be really careful about what narratives you kind of, I guess, like believe and fall into. And to also always check that fully diluted market cap. And, you know, I think it's not maybe not enough to check the fully diluted market cap. I think you have to go deeper and check like, okay, well, why is the fully diluted market cap $1 billion and the, and the circulating is like $10 million, for example. And there are some projects out there like that. You have to go look at the coin distribution. You know, is most of the coins with the team and investors Investors, or is it being paid out in some liquidity mining program? Because if it's being paid out out of a liquidity mining program, it just means that the token is going to stay, you know, stay put for a while. It's just going to either bleed out or kind of like go sideways. Um, you know, I, I think the CRV token is the perfect example of this, where Curve has obviously got like a, a ton of traction, right? Like an absolute ton of traction. It's one of the best DeFi protocols out there. Um, a legit team. They keep innovating. You know, obviously they're not a scam or anything like that, uh, but their token. Uh, is being paid out through a pretty lucrative liquidity mining program where they're paying out 2 million CRV a day. Now, the last time I checked the CRV price, it was around $2. So they're paying out $4 million a day. And I know people say, oh, okay, well, a lot of that is actually getting locked up uh, because of the CRV boost and, and things like that, the VCRV boost and stuff like that. And that's fine. I get that. But it's not all of it still being locked up. So even if like, a, a large chunk of it is being locked. I think 50, 60% of it is being locked. That's still $2 million a day of sell pressure uh, because a lot of the farmers are mercenaries at the end of the day. And their fully diluted market cap is, is still quite high at $2. I think it's uh, multiple billions or something like that. So from, from that perspective, you just kind of kind of have have to take all those things into account when uh, I guess like um, looking at these projects and evaluating whether you want to put your money into them in any capacity. And Obviously, that's not investment advice, just, just like general advice in this space and how to kind of like avoid scams because, you know, it's funny. A lot of the time, like the, the, the classic rule of if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. 
it kind of applies to crypto, but not really, because there actually is a lot of things that, that, that sound too good to be true that were actually true. Think about the Uniswap airdrop. If you told someone that um, you were airdropped at, well, I don't know the current uni price, but say it's like $20 or something like that. I think it's less than that, but say it's $20. If you told someone that you were airdropped 400 tokens worth $20 each for free for only, you know, interacting with this app once across all of your addresses, they would say to you, oh, this must be some kind of scam. That's too good to be true, blah, 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 right? And there's all these other, I mean, airdrops is the perfect example of something that, that seems too good to be true a lot of the time because some of these airdrops are worth a lot of money, but they're, they are true and they the liquidity is there for you to sell if you want to. And a lot of the time selling the airdrop was actually a bad idea. Like everyone who sold their Uniswap airdrop probably regrets it because they sold it below $10 at least or even below $5. So, um, you know, from that perspective, it's hard to use that rule of thumb. So for, for the way I just view it is, as I said, I look at the fully diluted values of these things. I also look at the kind of age of the project. I look at the, the team and things like that, their investors to see if they've got legit investors on board that you know, these investors don't want to put their names on, on scams or anything like that. So you, you hope that they've done their due diligence, but still they could miss things or they could just not care depending on the investor and stuff like that. So always good to just be on your guard on in DeFi, in crypto in general. Um, and, you know, obviously like falling into those other things that are just pure casino coins, like the dog coins and stuff like that. I mean, you know, I think most people understand that those things are just gambling things at the end of the day. You literally are just gambling when you're buying into them. So I think that's fine. But there are a lot of uh, projects out there that try to like act legit, but re in reality, they're just rug pulls or scams or just like, you know, insider pump and dump kind of things. Yeah. So yeah, anyway, I'll leave it at that. I think I've rambled a little bit too much on about that. But yeah, I just thought it was a, it was kind of like a, a, th a good thing to talk about considering that I'm seeing more and more of these kind of like ridiculous kind of tactics popping up lately from these projects, uh, basically scamming people. So the biggest news I think from the last 24 hours was Twitter dropping NFTs on Rarible. So you can see in my screenshot here that Twitter has a bunch of NFTs. They've got seven, there's only four pictured here that they've issued on Ethereum, of course, uh, and they're selling them via Rarible. I don't think that they've uh, put any for sale yet. All of these are not for sale. 20 of 20 editions. Um, now, the reason why this, I guess, is a big deal is for two, two reasons. One reason is obviously because it's Twitter, right? It's Twitter doing NFTs. It's, it's just legitimizing NFTs further. And I think it's just showing people that NFTs, you know, aren't in this kind of like bear market people think they are in. I think what ends up happening is that uh, NFTs are still there and they're still getting a lot of traction. But, uh, you know, obviously the market cooled down and the, and the money moved to like different kind of things. I, I think... During like the NFT kind of like mania, there was a lot of people just buying things that were just like total crap. They had no future and they were just buying it for the sake of it. And there was a lot of opportunists as well that came in and sold, you know, some of their old art that they just repurposed as an NFT and things like that. Uh, so that's why I think it's a, a, major, a, major, a really good thing is like the legitimacy aspect. And two... For those of you who don't know, Jack, the founder of Twitter, uh, and I think he's still the CEO, um, I'm not totally sure on that, but definitely the founder, um, he is a Bitcoin maximalist. Like he is, de He's definitely said multiple times in the past that he doesn't really care about Ethereum, doesn't want to buy ETH or whatever, or, or whatever it is, like classic Bitcoin maximalist speak, which I think is just a sad state of affairs for, for him. I really do think that Ethereum speaks to a lot of what he's trying to do and trying to achieve in the world. But the funny thing is, is that uh, to issue these uh, NFTs on, uh, you know, on Ethereum, he had to own ETH. And now this isn't Jack owning ETH. It's obviously Twitter, the company owning ETH. But they had to buy ETH to pay the gas fees, and they had to buy, um, you know, uh, uh, to, sorry, they had to use Ethereum to issue these NFTs. Uh, so. The, the reason why I bring up that as like a bullish thing or like something that's really interesting is the fact that I've, I've kind of talk, spoken about this before is that even if you hate Ethereum, even if you think it's like bullshit or, or a scam or whatever, or if you think that ETH is like a shit coin, you know, a lot of these people that think that still use Ethereum because it's just too tempting for them to do so because they're getting value out of it in one way or another, whether that's doing something on DeFi or doing something with NFTs. I mean, we saw plenty of Bitcoin come over to Ethereum during DeFi summer. And I'm sure within that Bitcoin, there was plenty of Bitcoin maximalists coming over saying, oh, well, I can stack more sats on Ethereum. I'm going to do this. You know, maximalist in the streets, you know, uh, uh, pro sorry, Bitcoin maximalist in the streets, profit maximalist in the sheets sort of thing. Uh, and I, I don't think that's like a bad thing. Um, I just think it's just funny when you when you kind of look at this and, and you think to yourself, well, you know, if you're using Ethereum, if you're buying ETH, uh, then you can't, you know, you, the, the fact that you're saying one thing on Twitter and doing another thing is just, uh, is just a pretty funny kind of juxtaposition there. So yeah, big deal anyway. 
Um, I think more and more companies are going to follow here. Obviously, I spoke about Reddit doing this the other day. Twitter's doing it. Maybe Facebook's going to do it. Instagram, TikTok, who knows? Like, we'll see. We'll see what happens there. Uh, but still, really cool to see this. And, and it's funny because I don't think Twitter exactly needs the money here. And maybe they're just going to do this. Um, I, I guess like this sale and kind of donate the proceeds to charity, which I think is probably the best way to do it. Uh, and and I'm just going to be curious to see what they do with this and if they do more in the future. So Perpetual Protocol announced uh, or introduced V2 uh, called Curie here of, of their protocol, which as they say here, this upgrade dramatically improves capital efficiency and increases fee capture for liquidity providers. Now, the one thing I did want to talk about when it came to this is the very interesting news that they will launch uh, Curie or Perpetual Protocol V2 on Arbitrum, so natively on Arbitrum. So this again is following the trend that I've been talking about how a lot of apps are now just going to bypass layer one entirely and go straight to layer two because there's no point really launching on layer one anymore when you know that users are priced out of it and you know that layer two is a very very close and you know that um you know that the, the end goal is for users to just be on layer two so why not just like you know focus all your attention on deploying on layer two doing everything right there focus on uh, uh, you know your, your kind of like marketing customer acquisition strategies business development uh, making the product as best as possible instead of having to worry about high gas fees and dealing with users having to worry about that and having to worry about optimize your code down to like the best way you can optimize it to get the most juice out of it for users and having to worry that users aren't using your app because of the gas fees and things like that. So, I mean, this is the third product that I know of that so far that is launching natively on, on kind of uh, layer two here. There was FutureSwap V3, which is launching on Optimism. Uh, no, sorry, Arbitrum. And then there was Lyra, which is launching on Optimism soon. Uh, and I think we're just going to see more and more of this. So, I mean, it's, I'm just really happy to see this trend playing out. I wrote a little bit more about this in the Daily Gray newsletter today, but I don't see this reversing. I do think that there'll be a lot of projects that stay on uh, layer one, of course, and that have like uh, both layer one and layer two kind of deployments, such as the biggest projects out there, like Maker, Aave, Uniswap, Compound, whatever. But I think a lot of the newer ones are going to say, well, layer one's really crowded. It's expensive. There's this whole new kind of like, I guess, like field um, design space on layer two. Let's just deploy there and focus all our efforts there. And, you know, I know Perpetual Protocol was on, I think they were on XDAI, um, uh, uh, you know, in their V1, which is a side chain. So it's not a layer two. Um, but now they're you know, obviously going to, uh, uh, to Arbitrum here. Now, I don't know. I didn't kind of like see anything about their XDAI deployment, if they're going to be deploying V2 on XDAI. But uh, I mean... I don't know if they kind of like really need to at the end of the day, because I do think that um, Arbitrum is probably the better solution here since it's an actual layer two that's going to be inheriting Ethereum's decentralization and security guarantees. And that's what we want at the end of the day. So yeah, really, really cool to see this. Uh, I think it's just really interesting, this trend that we've been seeing and I'm, and I'm excited to see it continue. So speaking of uh, different kind of like DeFi protocols heading to layer two, Synthetix is actually one of them as well. So Synthetix is going to eventually migrate off layer one completely and go straight onto Optimism. Uh, they're on there right now, but they're going to eventually migrate everything to Optimism. Um, but, you know, the tweet that they put out today was, wasn't was about that. It was about uh, Synthetix trading volume and how uh, I think last month it hit $1 billion in Synth trading volume, uh, which is 15% of their total tracked volume, uh, which means that uh, $6.75 billion in just one one month on, on the protocol here. Now, a lot of you may not have been hearing about synthetics lately. They've been kind of quiet. I know Kane has been putting out blog posts recently where he's been saying that he's going to come back and help the protocol along because he feels like he stepped away too soon and things like that. So uh, I think that with him back on board with their layer two deployments going forward, they're definitely going to um, have like a, a, a bit of a renaissance here, I think, synthetics. And I think that people are underestimating them. Now, I'll just close here. I, I own SNX tokens. So, I, you know, maybe you think I'm shilling my bag, but generally, like, I've held SNX tokens for a while now. And I just think that synthetics is. Uh, an underdog now. I used to be like the, the darling of, of Ethereum DeFi, but I think the fact that uh, their protocol doesn't, doesn't really work with high fees on layer one, it actually not doesn't really work. It doesn't work at all, it seems, uh, in terms of like being able to scale it at layer one. Um, whereas on layer two, I feel like they're going to get like so much more trading volume, so much more users because of that low fee environment there and the fast transactions, of course, and things like that. So really cool to see this traction. Can't wait to see them on layer two. Um, getting really excited to see how that plays out on Optimism. 
So 6 million ETH is now in the ETH2 deposit contract. This represents around 5.2% of the total current ETH supply, which is huge. I mean, this is what, 6 million at times 2,200. Last time I checked the ETH price would be $18 billion, something like that in the ETH2 deposit contract, securing ETH2, which is awesome. Like absolutely awesome. And I, the funny thing is this this just keeps trending up, right? Like people people uh, might think to themselves, yeah, you know, oh, maybe it's just going to taper off and we're going to stop seeing ETH fall into the deposit contract. But I don't think that's true. I think more and more ETH is just going to keep flooding in. More and more services for staking are going to keep popping up. Obviously, we have a lot of services already, like the centralized exchanges. Um, you know, uh, Rocket Pool's going live soon as well. We have uh, Lido and a bunch of other staking service providers out there. Um, and I'm curious to see actually what happens when Rocket Pool goes live and to see how many individual kind of users that don't have that 32 ETH uh, stake with with Rocket Pool here. Um, but yeah, 6 million ETH, that is going to get to 10 million before the merge in my mind. Uh, and I think that once the merge happens and people see that the APY shoots up to even something like 20%, they're going to FOMO into that as well. And, you know, just a little bit an anecdotal here, all the ETH that I'm buying these days, every time I hit 32 ETH again, uh, I put that into staking. Like every 32 ETH that I accrue goes straight into um, uh, a validator. Now, obviously that doesn't happen very often. 32 ETH is a lot of money these days. It's over $60,000. Um, but it's happened a couple of times now at this point from just my stacking ETH and buying and buying some cheaper, uh, like as, as we fell in price, and I'm just putting it into the, you know, to staking. And I think that's what a lot of people are doing right now is that they're putting it straight into staking um, and st just stacking more ETH when the prices are what they think to be a low price. Maybe we go lower from here, but who cares? If you're putting it into staking anyway, well, well, you know, you don't have to play the markets, you know, it's locked in there until the merge happens if you're doing it on your own and you basically get to accrue more ETH as time goes on. I think the APR is still about 6.5%, but as I've mentioned before, that's the APR just... Um just uh, if you if you account for like the uh, the ETH that you're accruing, it doesn't account for like the ETH price appreciation. So if ETH price like doubles, and that's conservative, I think from from here. But if ETH price doubles and goes back to its all time high, well then the rewards that you earn doubled as well. So you're earning much more than that 6.5% just from the appreciation of your rewards. But that 6.5% is denominated in ETH. So that's not denominated in dollars. Uh, so that's that's kind of like the, the interesting way to think about it. Now, I got a question here from Thomas that I wanted to answer where uh, he said, I have heard but would appreciate the clarity that 10 million ETH staked is the limit. After the limit is hit, does that mean you cannot stake unless someone pulls out first? Um, I'll be watching the Daily Wave for an answer, please. So here's your answer, Thomas. There is uh, not a limit of 10 million. There is plans to put in, I think, a, a, a soft limit of 30 million ETH being staked at any given time. Now, this is based on the amount of validators that are that are active. So that doesn't mean that it's like a hard limit. The reason why I say it's a soft limit is because, for example, there could be 60 million ETH staked, but what ends up happening is that only half of that ETH is an active stake. So only half of that ETH, 30 million ETH, or half the validators will be actively uh, participating in the consensus of the network at any given time. Um, so, which means that like, yes, there's 60 million ETH in the deposit contract, but only half of it at any given time, uh, is active and validating, which means that it'll rotate through, uh, as time goes on. So that's how it's going to work. It hasn't been implemented yet, but I think that's how it's going to work and it might, might change, but yeah, hopefully that answers uh, your question there on that one, Thomas. But on that note, that is it for today's refill, everyone. Thank you again for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't yet. Give that video a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks, everyone.